Some of you may be interested in um, what, what I'm doing and what I'm about. That's our website there, earthskywalk.com, earthskywalk.com. You can find out all about us. I'm going to be talking about landscape zodiacs in Britain, which is something that's interested me for a very long time. Um, it's an absolutely fascinating subject, which has never failed to kind of intrigue me. It's one that's rather gone out of fashion, but it's um, coming back in in a rather interesting way. And um, I think there are new insights about landscape zodiacs beginning to appear. But let's just start off with um, finding out where we are. Here we are in Glastonbury, and indeed, we are sitting on a landscape zodiac, the Glastonbury zodiac. Mm. This is the, um, the figure of the phoenix or eagle with the head on the tour here, the wings round here, and the square area of the abbey precinct, the tail. And we're sitting here in the hall and the Glastonbury assembly rooms right here on a landscape zodiac. So um, just as you've been hearing about crop circles, creating energies, um, if you believe in that kind of thing, which I think most of us do here one way or the other, we're right in a pretty powerful spot on the landscape zodiac right at this very moment. That's just useful to orientate you. What is a landscape zodiac? Well, there's a kind of definition, um, a representation of the zodiacal signs and symbolism found in the texture and morphology of rural and urban landscape, which broadly mirrors the zodiac in the constellations of the ecliptic. I mean, that's just for those of you who've never heard anything about this before and wonder what it's all around. I'm about, I'm aware that most of you are old hands at this, but let's see. Where did it all start? Well, it's useful to start with this lady, this rather elegant lady, Catherine Emma Maltwood, born in 1878, died um, in eight. In 1961, here she is in 1905, recently married. You can see a beautiful wedding ring there in a pre-Raphaelite pose. She was um, extremely rich. Um, she was a, a, a very, very talented artist, a very talented woman in many regards. She was a, a sculptress and a painter and um, a really very fine sculptress. But she also made a very fine marriage. She married John Maltwood who was a chemist at Oxford, who invented the OXO cube in 1911 and brought them a fortune which enabled them to retire in 1921, buy art all over the world, and generally for Catherine, indulge herself in all sorts of expensive hobbies like following zodiacs, having aerial photographs done of Somerset countryside long before the RAF did, and all sorts of things like this. And we have to thank the OXO cube <laughs> for the reality of landscape zodiacs in Great Britain. Next year, 2011, is the centenary of the Oxo Cube. There'll be all kinds of bargains, three for the price of one in Asda, and all the rest of it. Don't forget John Maltwood and Catherine and this landscape. You owe it all to the Oxo Cube. Very important. She was a very fine sculptress. This is one of her sculptures in in 1912, primeval Canada awaking from its sleep, a kind of Native American bisexual face, an extraordinary kind of figure. But she was also interested in esoteric traditions all over the world where she traveled. If you think of yourself as a new age person who's been to New Zealand, been with the Maori, been to Nepal, been to um, Mexico, been to South America, been to um, Africa, been to the Middle East, been to everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. This is exactly what um, um, Catherine Maltwood and John Maltwood did in their long retirement over many decades, collecting artworks and in, in, in investigating all these traditions. And this is um, a 1922 sculpture called the Holy Grail. She was always interested in Arthurian mysteries, British mysteries, but also a way in which you might bring all these things together. She was fascinated by theosophy, but she wasn't actually a theosophist. In 1927, she was so fascinating to a lady author whom she met in Canada that a book was written about Catherine in which she's the heroine, a sculptress heroine. It's a very important book to read if you want to know about this lady. She's personally um, attributed in, in the beginning of the book. And um, 
She was interested in levitation, meditation, all the spiritual traditions. She was um, omnivorous in her interests. She was also a feminist, an extraordinary um, radical thinker, quite a woman of the new age before the new age in some respects had woken up. A biography must be written about her by somebody who can really do that job well. In 1916 uh, or 17, she was given a book, The High History of the Holy Grail. She was living in London at the moment, at that time, but was interested in moving to Somerset because she got fascinated by the, the countryside here. She read this book, which is an Arthurian epic of Arthurian adventures, uh, purportedly written by monks from Glastonbury Abbey after the Abbey fire in 11 the 1180s in the early 13th century. And um, the, the, the story of the knights in, the, um, in this epic, I and mean, it's quite complicated to understand, it's not an easy book to read, although you can buy it in the High Street right now, not an easy book to read or understand, but something about it caught up Catherine, and she said, I've got to go and walk in Somerset, I've got to find out about these places where I think the knights were. And she began to realize that the knights were in fact around Glastonbury Abbey. These stories were all in the, the Somerset countryside. And one day, <clears throat> when she was looking at a map, sometime around about, I think, about 1917, 1918, possibly staying with friends, she hadn't moved into Somerset herself until um, the back end of the First World War. She was looking at an Northern Survey map and suddenly she saw, in the curve of the river here, the underbelly of a lion. It sort of came to her mixture of vision, mixture of insight, but suddenly there was a lion in the landscape. And a lady came to tea, so the story goes, partly apocryphal, because Catherine didn't really know what this lion was. She attributed it to the Arthurian stories in, 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 in the high history, but she wasn't quite sure. And lady came to tea who was a theosophist, and she said, I think Madame Blavatsky's written about things called landscape zodiacs in the 1880s. I wonder if this is part of a landscape zodiac. Later on, Catherine um, returned to this figure many times, and uh, here I've drawn it for you with, uh, sorry, I've photographed it for you with the curve of the river, the Leo figure appearing Later on again, and in an undated manuscript that I photographed in the, the Maltwood Archive in Victoria, Canada, she makes reference to Madame Blavatsky and the quote from The Secret Doctrine, which first of all outlines the idea of a landscape zodiac being something on the land reflecting the sky, as above, so below, she writes. And at the end, which is most fascinating, because I asked exactly the same question about Madame Blavatsky, Catherine writes, where did she get this from? Where did she get this idea from? There is no historical reference to landscape zodiacs existing at all before Madame Blavatsky writes in the 1880s in The Secret Doctrine and in slightly earlier writings as well. And Catherine didn't know about this document um, when she discovered the lion. And the friend came to her and said, what about um, the idea of this possibly being a landscape zodiac. So I'm slowly putting the jigsaw together of what was going on. Catherine then decided that she, over the months of the late part of the First World War and into the first years in the 1920s after the war, she moved here to Chiltern Polden, um, Chiltern Priory, um, just along the road to Bridgewater into a remarkable house that you can still see, a castellated mini mansion which sits there. And in that tower, like Rapunzel, she uh, brought together all her researches and started to constitute the idea of a landscape zodiac for the first time. She started to put this down in a series of maps, none of which sadly exist today, um, but she had these maps. And then she realized that Dent, the publisher of the High History of the Holy Grail, were going to make um, a second edition in the late 1920s. And she wrote to Dent's, and this is out of her papers, saying, please, can I put my maps at the back end of your book? Dents weren't very interested. They said, well, the maps aren't going to help us um, very much. They're not going to help the sales. They're not important for the reader. And in the end, she did manage to get one of the maps 
uh, put in at her own expense, as you can see um, from this letter. And this is what the map looked like that you get in the 1929 edition of the High History of the Holy Grail. It shows all the various places where the knights in the epic are playing their games and having their adventures with fabulous beasts and maidens and all the rest of it in the county of Somerset. Here are the levels, here's the island of Avalon, and here's the lion which she identified, and also perhaps the beginnings of an Aries figure here, and also the beginnings of um, one of the twins here. But she has written a, a round circle here, she has put in the word ecliptic, and if we look at that in a bit more detail, we can see um, that she's obviously already thinking about a zodiac, because she's got the word ecliptic there, but she hasn't drawn a bird in here yet, it's just an island shape. She hasn't really drawn in the um, Aries figure, but you can see it if you know what it looks like. And there is the beginning of one of the twins here, but the lion is there definitely. And it's very interesting that it's often a lion which first is found when landscape zodiacs are being found, which is an interesting kind of thought, something that's been noted before. That came out, I don't think it made much impression at Dents or anywhere else, but Catherine went on to accumulate all her material and she produced a book in 1935 um, which was uh, a complete outline of these giants as she put it in the somerset landscape for some reason or other she was very very fascinated by the idea of the equinoctial line east west so she turned the whole zodiac round usually we have the, um, the glastonbury aquarius figure here in the north and down at somerton we have the leo figure so she's got everything turned round there's a mysterious um, Solomon seal cross here in the middle, um, star of David in the middle, which is of course linked to theosophical ideas, but that disappeared in future traditions as did the red circles. And I've made a detailed analysis of all these different zodiacal patterns as they occur. Um, but this is the very first great picture of a landscape zodiac anywhere. The white dots are the stars from a planospheric drop down from the sky to the land and one of the things that Catherine was very aware of was how extraordinary was the correspondence between the sky and the land it's not a perfect correspondence but it's really rather impressive nonetheless i told you how she was a rich lady she went on to hire an aircraft from croydon airport which spluttered all the way across south of england the pilot leaned out nearly fell out and took photographs for her aerial photographs of these incredible effigies, which were very impressive. They are now most wonderful because they show all kinds of things like orchards and things that have all disappeared from the Somerset countryside, and I'll show you one of them later on. So there was this um, supplement that was brought out in 1937 on top of her 1935 book, and um, uh, landscape zodiacs are now up and away. She was very keen that science took this seriously, but science wasn't the least bit interested. They thought it was complete fantasy from a kind of, uh, I suppose, wild, rich, millionaires, brilliant sculptress nonetheless. Somewhat disillusioned, the Maltwoods left Somerset in 1938 and emigrated to Canada, taking the whole archive, all the material, everything about the landscape zodiac in Glastonbury now sits in Victoria University archive where you've got to go and study it if you want to see any of this stuff. Fortunately, I've been able to do that and, 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 and pick out some of this marvelous stuff. This is a final map uh, that we found recently in private hands in Glastonbury. It's nearly seven foot square, hand painted, beautifully prepared. This is a rather bad photograph that I've taken of it, probably almost certainly by Catherine again and I'm, I'm hoping we might get better pictures of it later on. This was probably done in the 1940s during the war in Canada and sent to somebody here in Glastonbury. Catherine dies in 1961, and even as she dies, another artist, the remarkable Mary Kane, born in 1916, died in 2008, is already getting interested in the Zodiac. She's skeptical about it, and she writes Catherine Maltwood a letter, Dear Mrs. Maltwood, she writes it um, in, I think it's July, just weeks before um, Catherine dies, sadly, and Catherine never saw this letter. But I'm told by Mary Kane that 
Catherine Martwood's husband, John Martwood, who died when he was 101, those OXO cubes are worth taking. Um, uh, and um, <clears throat> he died when he was 101. And he told um, um, Mary Kane that Catherine, in her last months of life, had a tremendous intuition that somebody was going to turn up and take over her work because there'd been kind of a desert of interest for a long time. And in fact, of course, this was the very um, well-known, lately and greatly missed um, Mary Kane, who many of you have met and know in this room, a great Earth Mysteries enthusiast. Mary Kane went on to develop the Zodiac, produce new pictures, um, pu publicize it. Her own art came into it. She made one or two minor changes, like turning the orientation of Scorpio round and so on and so forth. We, she researched it in all kinds of ways. Her husband, Osmond Kane, another artist, a stained glass artist, produced a series of extraordinarily beautiful pictures um, of the field patterns showing how the various figures like this Sagittarius figure and part of the Capricorn figure with a horn here uh, are found in the local countryside and the fields are still there. You can take the photographs, you can superimpose these beautiful paintings and they are just um, a kind of an aspect of art which is um, very attractive. Finally, um, Mary wrote a number of books. This is her most famous one. I see it downstairs in the basement for sale, for sale at five pounds. Do not miss this opportunity if you're totally befuddled about what all this is about. Read Mary's book. It's absolutely fascinating. For, for a fiver, it's an absolute bargain. Um, it's a kind of collector's item. They will go out of print eventually, but they seem to keep coming out of a crack in the ground forever. And um, there you are, wonderful stuff. So this is Mary Kane, who sadly died um, a couple of years ago. And I'm very, very glad and privileged that I knew her. And I'm part of the apostolic succession, as it were, of people interested in zodiacs. There are lots of other people, some of you in the audience, and many people in Glastonbury and around who are. But there are lots more zodiacs. This is from a little terrestrial zodiacs journal done in the 1980s, and it shows 39 um, zodiacs that were known about in about 1987. This is prepared by Philip Heselton, who edited that magazine, and very, very graciously, a couple of years ago, he gave me his entire archive. So I now have in my garage, as they say, um, I have um, material about 60 or 70. United Kingdom um, zodiacs, and I'm, I'm currently researching them. You can see a name here under number two, Anthony Thorley. And this, this is the chief zodiac here, which I sort of discovered in the mid 80s, um, to, just to show you how I'm nearly as old as the Oxo Cube. Um, there are lots of other zodiacs. I'm not going to say, say much about them. This is Sheila Jeffries, Cornwall zodiac. She now lives near Glastonbury. Um, here is um, the uh, Michael Burgess, um, Barry St. Edmunds Zodiac, more, more recent interest in this one, which is um, rather alive and well at the moment. This is the Cheviot Zodiac, which I was interested in myself. It has a, a vast guardian dog. And just to let you know that the, the tail area is called Waggy, just like um, um, I'm going to show you on the Glastonbury Zodiac. This is redolent with, again, Northern Arthurian mysteries, traditions, all the place names, all the coincidences, all the history fit in just exactly the same way. This occupied about four years of my life walking across Northern England um, to kind of work all this out. Very exciting experience before I came down to live in the Southwest. Here's John Billingsley's Hebden Bridge Zodiac, again, a venerable the Zodiac, in the sense that it's been sitting around for about 30 years now. John Billingsley, the editor of um, Northern Earth, that marvellous and enduring Earth Mysteries magazine that so many of you know well. Robert Lords, 1976, Pendle Zodiac. They all look slightly different and a bit weird, but they've all got this kind of characteristic of um, place names fitting and legends fitting the figures. It's all a bit kind of crazy. Jim Kimmis, the late Jim Kimmis, at the Onga Zodiac, I, I learned from John Billingsley only the other week that Jim Kimmis, um, almost at the end of his life, said it was all a hoax. He'd kind of made it up. 
Um, and uh, that was rather shocking for some, but there's a sort of life about um, zodiacs, a bit like corn crop circles. Although he says he made it up, nobody really believes him. It was a kind of disclaimer at the end of his life. And there's a wonderful story of how on the Scorpio figure, which the sting of the scorpion is very near the railway station, they found a box and opened it, and it was full of scorpions. It went into the local newspaper. It's t typical kind of um, zodiac um, symbolism. The Kingston Zodiac, found and worked out, discovered, if you like, by um, Mary Kane, because she lived all her life in Kingston and came and crossed the West Country and researched. And, uh, and then a, a couple of sort of newcomers. There's lots of newcomers. There's lots I've missed out, obviously. I'm just showing you other Zodiacs. This is the Bodmin Moore Zodiac, a, a book written which you can buy on Lulu by Nigel Ayres. He's a a modern artist with in, an interest in psychogeography, if any of you know what that is. It's a kind of intellectual, French intellectual idea about the effect of walking in cities. Um, you take, for instance, a map of the Berlin tube, okay, underground, and then you go to Newcastle upon Tyne and use the Berlin map to walk around Newcastle upon Tyne and have a very interesting experience. <laughs> which is full of synchronicity and significance. So actually the Berlin map works in Newcastle and the, and the Newcastle map works in Berlin. What is going on? That's what psychogeography is about. It's quite an interesting area to study. And Nigel is very interested in this and his website on the Bodmin Zodiac is fascinating. There's another Zodiac I haven't got a picture of. I just want to mention in Lincoln, run by Anthony Gill. He's another artist and teacher. He has a study group. He takes children around in a Zodiac bus from Lincolnshire County Council, and they go and study different parts of the Zodiac. The children go there and do artwork in the Zodiac. It's a very alive and well tradition. So there's a kind of new emergence of Zodiac interest. But to say more about what these Zodiacs are and what they're kind of carrying, I want to go back um, to Glastonbury quickly. Um, here we are on Aquarius again. Um, this is Catherine's uh, first picture, Catherine Mortwood's first picture, maybe in 1929 when she was submitting that map to Dents of um, the Chalice Well, the tour here. We have to turn it upside down because we're pointing north down. So I'll just turn it round and there we are. Showed you this before. We're sitting here on the tail. And what's interesting about this, this is. The phoenix bird, this is a kind of symbolic eagle car carrying the Aquarius energy. This is Aquarius on the Glastonbury Zodiac. But as you know, the phoenix arises every 500 years out of a burning pyre, which is kind of literally a fire under its bum. And it bursts out, probably goes ouch, and um, flies off again. And it's interesting that it's associated in Christianity with resurgam, with the idea of resurrection, and of course it became a symbol of Christ. And here we are where the fire would be, the tail of the, of the creature here. And what do we have here? Nothing but Glastonbury Abbey, St. Joseph's Chapel, the old church, the tradition of Christ, maybe by his own hands, building the first church in Christendom. The very beginning of Christianity symbolically starts in the tail of the resurgent phoenix. Quite a powerful kind of image. And think of so many other Glastonbergian kind of activities which are about new thinking and radical thinking, which start off in this very patch. It's an interesting idea. And then you look at the tour, and the St. Michael's Chapel that's on the top of the tour, and uh, as you know, it, most of it fell down in an earthquake, and this is the, the new building in, in the 14th century, but built by the, the monks of Glastonbury Abbey. And then you look at the tower, and you run your eye up the tower, and at the very top, there's a little kind of carving. And what is that carving? It is, of course, an eagle, the very highest thing um, in the whole Glastonbury landscape on that Aquarius figure is an eagle put there consciously aware of the Aquarius figure or just by coincidence. And that's really what we're going to be kind of looking at in this next series of pictures. I want to take you quickly to Street. Street, which is the adjoin adjacent giant village next to um, the town of Glastonbury, which is next to the city of Wells. They all have a population of 12,000. Some of them have seats in Parliament and some of them don't. Um, <clears throat> but I want to take you to Street to just tell you a little bit about 
um, street, because street is absolutely, again, re redolent with this symbolism. But to understand street, we've got to understand where it is. Street sits um, on the Aries figure, so it's on the head of the traditional astrological man. You know where the astrological signs in medieval um, astrological and indeed current med uh, astrological thinking rule different parts of the body. The head is ruled by Aries, the feet, its next door neighbour, are ruled by Pisces. So if you had a complete man, a perfect man, you'd want to link the feet with the head. And this was recognised in ancient tradition. I'm just going to have a little loop here. The um, alchemist was um, somebody who wore the fish on his head. This is the Phrygian cap of Mithras. This is a very, very powerful symbol of the complete person, the complete initiate. Here's another example of a local character, Joseph of Arimathea, painted here by 16-year-old William Blake, sitting on the rocks of Albion, but he's being given again a Phrygian cap, showing how Joseph of Arimathea was considered to be an initiate. So the idea of a fish bursting out of the head of somebody is a kind of complete way of considering um, perfection or the initiate. Here we've got an aerial picture, this one's been done by Mary Kane, of the lamb sitting there with its head there, sitting down, its tail here, and you can see the fish here bursting out of its head. You can see it more clearly here. There's the fish burning, bursting out of the head. Here's the head, here's the high street of, um, of street, and the whole of the area around here. Now, in about 18, uh, uh, 30, 1830s, there were a couple of farmers, James and Cyrus um, Clark, farming sheep here. And uh, Cyrus decided that he would start to make, following a local tradition slightly, sheepskin clothes. And the whole village of street began to blow up, bigger and bigger. This was a very successful industry. Brother James said, we've all got these little bits which I could use. I could make them into shoes, he said. Cyrus, this is an apocryphal story, but I like it. Cyrus said, you can make shoes if you like, but you go on the other side of the road. <laughs> And so he went to the fish side, which rules the feet. And of course, this is Clark's shoe factory here. And I just want to show you how extraordinary this new community, only really 200 years old, reflects these zodiacal energies. Let me just take you down the street. First of all, we've got Clark's shoe factory, which is on the shoe fish side of the road. And very famous. I bet most of you have worn a pair of Clark's shoes sometime in your life. And, um, and on the other side of the road, on the sheep side of the road, we have sheepskin shops, lots of them in the high street, more of them 20 years ago than there are now, but still it's most notable. And on the other side of the street, um, we've got um, a fish um, shop that's selling fishing gear right where the fish tail is, but on the right side of the road. And these are the kind of synchronicities that you get in a landscape zodiac. You've got men's footwear on the um, fish side of the road, and you've got um, um, lamb's legs being sold in the local Tesco's a fortnight ago, and also in the street, um, the butchers are telling you this is about sheep. This place is about sheep. They can't help but do it. There's something in their brains burrowing away, saying you have to show us that you're sitting on the Aries figure, and they do dutifully, unwittingly do this. And this is what's so fascinating. And even the name of the local baker's shop. And then when you pop across the road, you see that the local dentist is one of them as well. There's hundreds of them in um, street. And I'm not exaggerating to make a joke. You can look at this statistically and you start to realize there's an aggregation of data about sheep, shoes, sheepskin. The whole of street is dependent on the whole idea of a lamb. How is that? Oh, finally, you remember what sheep, uh, uh, Aries rules, the head? Down that street, there are 10 hairdressers and barbers. You walk down the equivalent street tonight when you go for a meal out in Glassbury High Street and you'll find one. What is going on? Are they head centered? There's a cafe called the Mad Hatter's Cafe, just next door. I won't show you that. 
Let's go quickly to Taurus. So now we'd be expected to find bull-like characteristics. Here we are at Compton, Compton Dundon. This is Compton High Street here, down here. There are the, the horns of the bull, and you can see the nose here. Just as in the heavens, only the front part of the bull shows in the Glastonbury Zodiac. But in this old photograph, <clears throat> taken by Catherine Maltwood. Isn't that a beautiful aerial photograph taken in 1927 by that plane from Croydon? Down the main street here, there are just six farms, no bijou cottages like there are today, just six farms, and every single one of those farms was a cattle farm in a short street. Extraordinary synchronicity coincidence. I mean, I'm quite sure there are lots of millions of other cattle farms around in Somerset, but to walk down a, a street and just find six farms, and I was talking to the farmer who works here just the other day about these farms, and he was telling me about it, and it really is extraordinary. I can name them all for you. The bull's eye was actually a pond. It's been dried up now, but pointing at it in the field here was a rifle range, pointing exactly at the bull's eye. That's what happens on zodiacs. A strange kind of eerie, weird coincidence synchronicities, as if the land somehow, just as with crop circles, was kind of calling the Taurian energy in. Let's go to Libra and have a look at Libra. Libra isn't a scales, it's a dove. You can see the dove here. Um, it's holding, it's said, a communion wafer in its hand, and this is the church here of the village of Barton St. David's. This area here is called, Bart called Boltonsborough Flights, this particular bit here. This bit along here is called Gosling Street. Um, if I go to this picture here, at Plot Gate here is the largest goose farm I've ever seen. White birds, 600 of them, running around in the field here on a white bird. I'm quite sure just as nobody in Wiltshire has ever been into a crop circle who lives there, most of the people living here have no idea they're living on a white dove. And yet, they start naming their houses after birds. And I've taken the number of houses, there's a marvellous map which gives you all the named houses. There are 182 named houses in the village, and over 12% of them are named after birds, which I think is a st statistical excess. So there's a kind of bird-like energy that's happening on the Libra figure, and it goes on. The church, Barton St. David's, this is St. David's, wasn't named until the 15th century. It's a very late name to use St. David. St. David of Wales, that is. St. David of Wales, though, is the patron saint of doves. There's no other saint is a patron saint of doves. Lots of saints are associated with doves, but St. David actually is the patron saint of doves. What's going on? It's crazy. It's mad. And of course, the dove is a sign of peace, and Librans are always peaceful people, aren't they? Trying to find the balance, the mediators. Let's finally just look at the great dog of Langport. Now, this is um, a 13th figure which sits outside the Glastonbury Zodiac, guarding it. It's a tradition of ancient um, Celtic... Um, uh, iconography, you get it in the Book of Kells, you get it in the Lindisfarne Gospels, in those early Celtic and early Saxon uh, religious texts, you get the idea of a guardian dog guarding, as it were, the wisdom, guarding, in this case, the whole of the ecliptic, the whole of the universe. Um, now, the great dog of Langport is very impressive. I've called this a drift into dogginess because I want to explain to you that in fact there's a sort of fascinating change going on here in the landscape. Here is the dog's head photographed by Catherine Markwood. Burrow Mump on the Michael Mary line here, that's the direction to Glastonbury. You can see up the nose and along the forehead of the dog to Ear Lake. This place is called Ear Lake. This is called Othery or Other Ear if you like. Uh, then there's more names here. This place is called the River Tone, or Tongue, if you could put the G in, from Taunton. And uh, this is the main river along here. But you can see this jowlish sort of face of the dog with the eye here, really very impressive. And indeed, um, Catherine Malt was, was very impressed when she saw it. Let's look at the whole figure. It's five miles across. Here we are, Borough Mump again. Ear Lake Moor, Othery. 
um, head drove, lease drove, leaseway drove where the lead would be, little hook where you would fix it on, around the corner to wag where the tail is. Um, and then you've got all these names like cur, re-rival, um, heels where the heels are, curry here, curload here, all these doggy names. What on earth's going on? Five miles across, and yet the sea used to encroach all this area until the late 18th century when it was drained. This whole area was underwater. The, um, the, this whole area was underwater as well. So I, I should mention also that the um, heraldic symbol for Langport is supported by two dogs, which has been there for hundreds of years. So what have you got here when this figure couldn't be recognized on a map much before the mid 19th century? It just isn't there on a map because of the drainage of the levels. You can't say it's ancient because it's not. It's modern. It could only be recognized by some incredible mystical visionary <coughs> sculptress lady in the 1920s when she looked at the map and plodded all around the fields and picked up all the folk tales. So what's going on? Well, let us just look at the ancient names. The word cur, which we now see as very dog-like, actually comes from the old British word for boundary, cru or cru. It's been changed into the word cur. Cur load, load means um, uh, ford across a river like Middle Load Street in, in Glastonbury, curry and so on. And of course you're moving towards curry house here, aren't you? I mean, you are actually getting to the point of seeing the word balti coming in next. Um, then the word for sea in Saxon is ear. So you get sea lake, which of course is what it was. It was a tidal lake. And the modern name ear lake just happens to be exactly where the dog's ear is. And you saw how beautiful that ear was sculpted. Similarly, wag is a word for wall in Saxon. Modern name wag, the tail of the dog. Now, I would argue this is a kind of drift, a process, a very complex process over hundreds of years of drifting slowly into aggregating, into um, dogginess, into a canine features. What's going on here? It's as if, as you were hearing from Francine in the previous talk, the land was kind of singing a song, singing a kind of dog song, bringing it out for some incredibly visionary lady in the 21st, 21st century, 20th century to actually recognize. You can see it as a kind of enchanted landscape. I mean that in the most respectable way. I don't mean magical and bewitched. I mean literally enchanted. The kind of landscape that indigenous peoples recognize automatically. I've got to put an academic slant on it because I'm hoping to get some of these ideas through eventually into my PhD and I've called it informational coherence. What's that? Well, it's an accumulating aggregation in a landscape across and through time of a matrix of closely related information leading to a recognition or a moment of recognition of the nature of the whole. That's when Catherine looks and says, oh my God, a lion. That's informational coherence. When all that material in the street area is about shepherds and sheep and shoes and sheepskin and all that. It's a tissue of synchrony because these are all synchronicities with the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. An extraordinary experience. And finally, it's a complex phenomenon uh, which is too complex to be simply and solely coordinated and created by men and women. What I mean by that is that this isn't a series of Chinese whispers from ancient times, an oral tradition of passing on information about generating a dog. It's too much to believe that. It's something more complex, something much more fascinating. So let's just look at what some of the properties are. I've not mentioned them all, but I just want to go through some of them uh, and have a quick look at these. We're talking about thousands of years of development. I mean, the landscape of the Glastonbury Zodiac is geological. And after it's geological, it's shaping those animals in geological time. It's then you've got natural plant waves of ordinary plant evolution, forests and things long before man takes over. You've got animals grazing. You've got all kinds of natural processes happening before man comes in some thousands of years ago and begins to use 
um, the landscape and leave his mark on it, which won't happen for perhaps two and a half thousand years. And then very slowly there are fields and then roads and then place names and changing place names. And slowly you're getting this effigy emerging. But there's no historical record. Nobody ever references it. It's not referenced at all until Catherine Maltwood has her ooh-ah moment. And that's very interesting. There's no history of, of these zodiacs. Then there's the apparent capacity to influence and affect people. And I have no doubt about that, all these man people who became hairdressers in the street. I mean, why on earth did they all go to work on the head figure of the zodiac? I mean, what's causing them to do that? I mean, you would say, come on. Just be skeptical about this. It's sheer chance. No, it's not. When you've studied 60 zodiacs, you start to realize there's something very strange going on, very important and very difficult to understand. And then there are all these synchronicities, the interconnectedness between the myths of the place, the legends, the folklore, the history and the current happenings. Last year, when I walked down Street High Street, and was counting the hairdressers to see if any had gone to the wall or come back again, as it were, overhead, there was a huge um, mass of scaffolding up against the, the Clark factory. The name of the scaffolder? R-A-M. Ram. <laughs> well, it wasn't there this year, but I mean, you know, consistently it's there. There are lots of similarities to sacred sites and the phenomenon around sacred sites. And you heard some of that already from the implications over crop circles. It's all the same kind of strange phenomenon. You get magical and divinatory processes. You bump into people on zodiacs and strange things happen to you and wonderful kind of openings happen, strange meetings. It's very, very divinatory. And then there's a sort of fascinating connection with the perceptions of the contemporary discoverer, Catherine Maltwood, Anthony Thorley, whoever. You have this sort of strange feeling um, that you have a kind of connection. There's a kind of, in the process of so-called discovery, of a landscape zodiac, you're in a kind of strange dialogue through time and space with the landscape in a very, very extraordinary way. And finally, um, you have many, many formative features which just don't make sense in terms of ordinary linear causal process. You just don't get the feeling it's A, B, C, D. There's too much kind of collapse of time involved. It's weird. It's strange. And crop circles are rather similar, aren't they? I think there's a lot of similarity, some explanations. These are just broad, loose explanations. OK, Catherine Mott would believe the Sumerians came to Sumerset, OK, and um, crafted all these things. And that was a feeling that was around with a lot of writings by a guy called Waddell. And there's one or two enthusiasts of Waddell I know in the room here. Um, who believes that we have a very, very powerful relationship with Sumeria and um, the Sumerians and the Sumerian tradition, and that somehow or other that civilization was a wider civilization which affected British countryside and history and so on. I doubt it. It's a possibility. The idea of ancient cultures passing dogginess ideas along from man to um, child um, through the generations by oral tradition I, is just too stretched for my imagination. I just can't take it. Anyway, Chinese whispers always gets the message wrong by the end of the row. If it started off as a dog, it should have finished as a giraffe, is my thinking anyway. Then there's the idea of animism, the idea of the landscape carrying consciousness, like um, Francine was speculating about. It's a very compelling idea. One really does get the feeling that the landscape is carrying consciousness. It's an idea I, I like a great deal. And it's also very much the way traditional indigenous cultures consider land in this way. It's a living being. And we are just in it and part of it. And of course, the whole idea of Australian Aboriginal song lines is a kind of example of this extraordinary, transcendental kind of interaction, which collapses time and space and causality. And um, it's very challenging and counterintuitive. But if you go into what song lines are about, <clears throat> like, for instance, Paul Devereux has, um, who you'll be hearing later on, you, 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 you find a lot out about this kind of phenomenon. And, Academics are also considering ideas of enchantment, um, a kind of a new term to consider a form of sacred, a, a, a sacred landscape. 
but generated by a creative dialogue between the living and the land. The land needs our acknowledgement, our acceptance, our observance, our ritual, our, or maybe our worship, our laudation, to really reflect its sacred energy. And we need that sacred energy in order to be able to kind of feel impelled and compelled and joyous enough to carry out the ritual. It's a dialogue, it's a loop. The land needs us, we need the land. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote about that beautifully. He believed in that idea and he put it into his great Lord of the Rings cycle um, in a very important way. The Greeks and the Romans, of course, believed in genius loci, the spirit of the place, influencing the entire local environment. Genius loci affected everything. They would say about street, well, there's a genius loci there that's all into hairdressing, sheepskin, and all the rest of it. And even the people's faces, the Greeks would argue, should increasingly move towards a sheep-like shape if they were living in street. Well, you can check that out later in the restaurants. Um, but I'm being serious. These are ideas that the Greeks brought out and other um, cultures have exercised these ideas as well. They shouldn't be off the list of things we look at. And then finally, there's that lovely idea about simulacra, which I have a lot of time for. In one of the talks I do, I spend 20 minutes showing fabulous simulacra pictures. John Michel, the late, great John Michel of this very platform, John Michel's concept of the extraordinary representations in nature which mimic our culture and ideas, faces in rocks, um, is a very important idea. How do the rocks of a particular place reflect the indigenous faces of the people who live there? I could show you pictures of native North America, which I know quite well, and show you the native North Americans in the rocks there. You don't see them in Chinese rocks. You don't see them in British rocks in the same kind of way. There's a very, very fascinating process going on here, which academics need to think more about. I'll just show you my favorite um, simulacra picture, I hope, here we are, which is a piece of mica about one and a half inches by two inches. It's about 40 million years old. And look what's in it. It's quite extraordinary. How are these little guys running up and down with the trees and in the houses and all the rest of it in a, in a lump of rock from 39 million years ago? What's going on? This is a simulacra or a simulacrum, more accurately, one of John Michel's favorites and one of mine. He's got a book full of them, which are wonderful to look at. But come on, explain this and I'll leave the platform. I mean, this is the challenge to us. This is the challenge. This is an earth mystery. This is an earth mystery. Come on, think about it. There's lots of other examples. If you're going to poo-poo that one, I'll produce five more, which are more difficult to deal with, OK? So I'm really then challenged to consider the quantum world. The quantum world is the world we have to kind of try to kind of take account of. The trouble is that in our culture, although we live in a quantum reality, the final reality is quantum. I tapped this machine, this incredible piece of apparatus, which is, of course, relying also on quantum ideas. But um, we're talking here about ultimate physical reality, and it's totally a causal. It's totally indeterminate. It's totally probabilistic. It doesn't have any of the qualities of cause and effect which we honor and need so much in our material world. And when you look at zodiacs and some of the other phenomena that I've been sharing with you, you are tempted to think, well, it's, it's a bit like we're finding in the experience of zodiacs. I want to just mention a couple of things which I think are quite important. I'm going to mention them. In quantum physics, there are a, a number of experiments that have been done consistently, quite predictably consistently, where consciousness and observation can affect the past. This is called backward causation. There are interesting books written about this, and I haven't time to go into them about them, but the point is that Catherine Maltwood could have been affecting the past in her current thinking. When she looked at the lion and went, ooh, ah, perhaps a pulse of energy, a pulse of information at a quantum level passed backwards in time right to the Big Bang. There are physicists who are writing that now. John Wheeler is the most famous example. There's some wonderful books to read about this. 
this idea that maybe the moon isn't really there unless you look at it. And certainly not there as we would recognize it or understand it when we don't look at it. Now, these are challenging ideas, and you find it very uncomfortable and very counterintuitive, but they're necessary to grab hold of if you're going to understand some of the phenomena that I'm confronted with, with landscape mysteries. Retro intention is where you take some of those ideas into um, you know, the, the, the area, if you like, parapsychology, and um, brilliantly, Lynn McTaggart has written about this in the intention experiment, but lots and lots of other books. Retro intention is where you influence the past through concentrating on something here and now. The classic example is praying for people to get them better. But when you open the envelopes, you find that, yes, you did make them better, but they died 10 years ago. How does that work? There are experiments that have been shown that it does work. It's consistent. There are thousands of these published experiments, but nobody wants to take any notice of them because they're so uncomfortable and so counterintuitive. I think we have to take these ideas up. Quantum entanglement is where two particles in space are just one. So the idea of locality disappears. But why not also have them in time? And there are people arguing now that quantum entanglement somehow exists so that time collapses. Now, all these ideas are very friendly to me when I think I want to explain landscape zodiacs, drifts into dogginess, and all that kind of thing. So I can't go on now speculating more because I'm, I'm going to lose my time. But I'm just speculating at the widest level, and I'm trying to develop a quantum model at the moment in my academic thinking, which I'll perhaps share with you when I'm more confident about it, and which begins, I think, to explain some of these phenomena. And note, all of you who are doing those Earth Mysteries work, you know you're always seeing patterns in the landscape, and you can't find any rhyme or reason for seeing them from 5,000 years ago, but they're there. Have they come from you? Are you affecting the landscape 5,000 years back through your nerdy, obsessed, passionate, intent, focused, mad, Earth mysteries kind of thinking? I do. What about you? So does mind or our consciousness carry or enable quantum phenomena? Can a part of us be everywhere at once so that occasionally we have conscious perceptions of such a wondrous thing? No problem if you ask the shaman. But trying that on your PhD viva is more difficult. <laughs> but I'm going to try. I haven't finished quite yet. We're going to have a bit of fun now. One thing, some of you are saying, where can I read about this? The answer is in the Goldilocks Enigma by Paul Davis. It's a start, an easy start. Read this book if you want to believe some of the mad ideas that I'm trying to start to share with you about backward causation, how we might have created the universe, the whole galaxy, and God knows what else. What an idea. Wouldn't go down too well. Um, in some churches, would it? But why not try it out? It's kind of an interesting one. You don't have to be big-headed. It's quite a nice idea that you might have created the universe. Let's have a bit of fun to finish with. The Gypsy Switch. Jill Smith was a lady who was in Glastonbury some 30 years ago. A gypsy came to her in one of the cafes here in the town, handed her a little map, and this map was of a traditional gypsy route around the British Isles. Every month, the gypsies stopped and had a different horse fair at every change of the sign of the zodiac around the, the country. This was the map that she drew. She, she saw that each place, Capricorn here, down at Avebury, and then um, to Glastonbury for Aquarius, and then round the whole of the zodiac. Um, this was a journey she had to make. She made it in a gypsy caravan with her newly born son, Taliesin. And then she wrote it up in a little book called The Gypsy Switch, because this is the name of the journey that the gypsies took. In the middle is the recumbent stone circle in Derbyshire, Arbor It's a very, very fascinating tradition, this. Not much is known about it, but I've done a little bit of research into it. When I first heard about this in the 1980s from Jill Smith at an Earth Mooton mixed uh, meeting in, in Sheffield, I wrote to her, she was living up here, um, near Callanish at the time. She's been backwards and forwards between Callanish and Glastonbury ever since, and now lives back up in Callanish. And I asked her about this, and she told me as much as she could about it. And then I had an incredible insight. I realized that each of these stopping off places were, in fact, places where there were known landscape zodiacs. There's a big one in Ireland, the one near Appleby. There's several near Durham, down through York, Lincoln, Cambridge, Ongar, Kingston, you've heard of those already, Avebury. 
this was a zodiac of zodiacs. This was a British zodiac made up of landscape zodiacs. And the gypsies were apparently traveling around it in a circle. And this got me really kind of very excited because <clears throat> I realized that between Sagittarius and the arrow of Sagittarius and the arrow of Scorpio on the ecliptic, where the crossover is between the galactic equator and the ecliptic was the famous galactic center. And this was years ago, I realized this, um, I must have been 15 years ago, and I got very excited about the idea that somewhere in the landscape, in a zodiac, between the Sagittarius figure and the Scorpio figure should be the galactic center. So I started finding galactic centers all over England. I won't tell you where they all are. The villages just get sucked in and disappear. It's quite scary. They're all black holes, of course. Anyway, just to remember that the ancients must have known about this, whoever the ancients were. They're people who, you know, we can believe in. We don't know who they are. But because the ancient sigil for Sagittarius was an arrow, and the end of the scorpion's tail is another arrow, and those are the only two arrows in astrology for the science of astrology. And you line them up in the heavens. One point's there, one point's there, and they point to blackness in the sky. No stars, nothing. That's the galactic center. How did they know? Perhaps it's another coincidence. I don't know. But I got very excited because I realized that this galactic center in um, every year from about 1989 through to 2024 was going to be the place where the sun apparently rose on the 21st of December, winter solstice. Every year, the sun would be at this point where the crossover is between these two figures rising. It would appear to rise, the sun, from the very place that you might imagine an intelligent culture might imagine that it's come from. If they had a concept of the middle uh, of the galaxy, why not have the sun arising from the place of its own birth? In, our, in astrological terms, the sun would be conjunct, the, the, the galactic center. And so it's turned out to be. And as you know, we've notionally taken up the Mayan long count and decided notionally and culturally to honor this moment by December the 21st, 2012. And people are now writing books about it, which I've seen go like this in the last 25 years, uh, 25 months. Absolutely fascinating. I just honor Paulden Jenkins, a, a local Glastonbury astrologer and well-known character who many of you know, a great person of the town, um, in that he noticed this is way back in 1987, where I, I picked it up from from him then. The point about this <clears throat> wonderful, incredible moment, first time the sun is going to do this, as you know, for 26,000 years, something which Jeff Stray's marvelous book, books, have demonstrated that so many other cultures were aware of, that at the turn of this century now, we would have this extraordinary moment um, where the sun appeared to return to the place, as it were, in the sky from where it was born so that we would have a new burgeoning, a new change, a changing time, transcendent times, the end of one era, the beginning of new one, not the end of the world, but a major transition. I got very excited about this. Here is the marvelous work that's being done by um, uh, Philippa Glasson and, uh, and Nick Mann showing how at the winter solstice of 2012, the sun will roll up the tour and be exactly at this incredible point, making the tour really a rather special astro-archaeological place. And so I returned to my gypsy switch map, getting very excited. I thought, hey, there's got to be a, there's got to be a galactic center on this map. Where is it? So I found my Scorpio, and I found my Sagittarius. Just to remind you, we've got a couple of zodiacs, one for Onga, in um, Essex, and one at Kingston, done by Mary Kane. And then I suddenly realized, some years ago, there's at least eight or nine years ago, I suddenly realized that the Galactic Center would be in London. But if you draw um, it between these two um, uh, zodiacs, it's not quite in London. It's slightly to the east and north of London. And I suddenly realized that it was Hackney Marshes, where in 2012, if we could win the Olympic bid, we would invite the whole global family to sit on our 
national zodiac at the point of the galactic center in the year when the rest of the world is getting to know about these things and get the vibes from Hackney Marshes, somewhat toxic at the moment, but you know, improving <laughs> by the month. And this really excited me because I thought, well, what will happen when all these people come to play their games? Forget about terrorism, forget about commercialism, just enjoy the energy idea. The British National Zodiac has called the world to play the highest form of spirit in the summer of the year when the whole world would be more and more aware of the whole idea of transition from one age to another. We call the world to play at Hackney. I thought, wow, that is quite something. And that, how did we get it? I must just tell a story which may be apocryphal. They say, I mean, I had said, we will never get this place. We'll never win the bid. Paris was going to win the bid. President Chirac was quite sure they had all these stadia already prepared. And then President Chirac, it is said, about a fortnight before the vote was taken by the Olympic Committee, made up of 24 people, plus or minus Princess Anne, um, as one of the representatives, he was at a dinner, and you must never, ever go on talking after an interview, as Gordon Brown has recently found out. You must never, ever do this. You must turn your mic off. And never allow those <laughs> private events to ever come out into public, because they lose elections, don't they? Um, anyway, President Chirac went slightly away from the table where he'd been having the dinner, and he said, I believe, this is the apocryphal story, Finnish food is the worst food in the world. There were three Finns on the Olympic Committee. <laughs> and two of them afterwards said, we would never vote for Paris after that insult. The other one spoiled his paper. Oh, it's sick, I don't know which. And of course, we won by three votes and got the, the national. And, and if I was going to be a native North American at this point, I would say, spirit moves in a very powerful way. Thank you very much indeed.